So, notice the word artisan up there. Notice the word artisan up there. Let me just plant that. That's going to come back to us. I think that is one of the solutions. I think one of the strange things that's going to have, have to happen to this industry is a return, a regression, if you will, to past practices. Not necessarily with past technologies, just with past modes, past attempts, past uh, ways of working and thinking. Now, first of all, when you are going to design sustainably, uh, there's no, well, okay, I was going to say there's no point. Of course, there's always a point to do the best you can. But what we have to do is we have to consider the entire life cycle of a product. If we're really going to be successful at this, and we have to in the next couple of generations. It has to be all the way. It has to start with the generation of materials. And I mean, we could use the word harvesting, but I think uh, the word generation is also in there, because we may have to think about this slightly differently. <coughs> and harvesting can be a very, very large word. Uh, notice the circle going back from reuse, recycling, and disposal to harvesting. And this is, this is, you see, how nature works. This is inspiration from nature. Nothing in nature is really waste. It's only a point of view. Everything in nature that is produced as waste by something becomes material for something else. And that's really the key. Uh, if we can adopt that strategy, not as a gimmick, not as something cute, but as a way to do this, we're going to be way further down the road, way faster than anybody has done before. Um, going back to the craft tradition as a model of how to operate, and this is pretty radical. This is not something that's going to happen overnight, but this is possibly the way to go because we have to stop shipping things halfway across the globe only to have them shipped back and then back again. We may have to start dealing with smaller market segments, um, uh, smaller networks, using high tech perhaps as a way of creating more efficient markets in smaller areas. Uh, I'll get back to that in a moment. I think that the craft tradition becomes a teachable model. I don't think we go back to the craft tradition. We can't go back to the 17th century or the 15th century. We can't even go back to the 20th century. We can use it as a teachable model, as general principles, in that uh, the craft tradition of making, well, anything, but in this case, clothing, was generally energy efficient. It did not rely on uh, large-scale manufacturing but even if it does, it did not require uh, all that transportation I was just talking about. The materials are generally low impact because in the, artic in the artisan tradition, the materials are generally locally produced and um, again, without the massive bit of transportation. The kicker is probably quality and durability. This is something we have to get away from the fast fashion model. The fast fashion model is killing us. And it's the quality and durability that has to start becoming designed in, in such a way that the consumers will actually, like I say, wake up to a fait accompli. It's, that's it. This is what we've got. Now, this is going to be a tricky one. Because obviously the point of fast fashion is the quick turnaround, is the fast profit. And so now you're going to start telling the corporate office but no, we're not going to move all these units. So this is where the system is going to have to have a little bit of a shock. And that's where the biggest resistance is going to be. The reuse, the repairing, and recycling. The three R's, you can call them the four R's if you go with the repurposing. Uh, but we'll fold that into, into reuse. It's obvious. So a few words about energy efficiency. That in an artisan tradition, we would choose manufacturing processes 
that tend toward a human scale, what does that mean? That means that we are becoming human-centric. We are not um, working with in so large groups of people that we do not recognize who we're working with. Um, we tend to uh, go for the local rather than the global. We tend to go for the, uh, shall we say, known in that locality rather than just let's find the factory that can do it for the lowest price and so on. And the lowest possible energy consumption, now this is tricky, this is where we can't go back or we will have a difficulty of going back. We have to reduce our energy consumption by other means. Now, we're not going to suddenly train thousands of people in handcraft methods. So where are we going to get the energy? If we're not going to use the large factories, what are we going to do? Hold that thought. We think about low impact materials. And this is something that's becoming very obvious in the food chain. This is something that this is possibly a lecture that could be very easily switched over to, to foodstuffs as well. Uh, we've seen a little bit of a greening of the food supply, but we're also getting the occasional shock of what it is we're actually eating, right? Can anybody say pink sludge, right? Or as now in Britain, with all the horse meat that they're, they're getting. No. Not that there's anything wrong with horse meat, but you know, there's this idea that we've kind of we seem to have lost some focus. We've lost some notion of what it is we should be doing with the things we make and the things we eat and the things we produce and the things we feed our children. I don't know. It's it's it's. Uh, it's not necessarily true that the modern age has just produced wonders and benefits. But I'm one of the people who would never want to return to an older age, an older time. And uh, like I said to somebody yesterday, I was discussing this with, um, whenever anybody says, oh, I, I would love to live back in those days or back in those days, I, I say, I have two words for you, modern dentistry. And that's pretty much my, my point of view on that. Uh, but there are things, my point is really that there are things we can't do without. And there are things we shouldn't do without. You see, it's about getting everybody to a sufficient level, not for some of us to disappear into the murk. Right? And uh, so we look at the non toxic start to avoid the chemicals. Now this is going to be a problem, perhaps, and this is where designers come in. Because there are choices to be made in the design process, and that's where these gates show up in a moment. So low energy production of non-toxic materials using sustainably produced items. Uh, fair trade, uh, low fertilizer, cyanide, that kind of thing. Okay. Cyanide, cyanide. We have acceptable levels of cyanide in our drinking water. I always wonder about that. Cyanide and apple seeds. There you go. Perfectly natural. Perfectly natural. <laughs> so anyway, the quality and durability question is something that you have to educate your consumers on. We become accustomed to things. People become habituated very, very fast. And it's obvious to me, it may be less obvious to you, who are mostly born after 1990, I imagine. Um, but it's become obvious to me how habituated we have come to things that don't last. It's not even that we don't care, it's that we don't even notice. This is just how it is. And we throw away, not because we're wasteful, it's just it's what we do. Things don't last and we throw them away.
So we have to re-educate, we have to reawaken, we have to uh, bring back the idea that things should last, things have to be durable. But in order for them to last, they also have to be of a quality and of a type that somebody would want to have around. Right? It can't just be, here's your prison uniform, it's going to last you for 50 years. Right? You have to want it to last, and that's where design comes in again. Well designed, well made, will last. That's a fairly good equation. And of course, the repairability. The idea that we have to design things in such a way, and we have to design systems that allow for this. And this is a social issue. This is also an education issue. That when we get to the point where we no longer have the talent, we no longer have the know-how, we no longer have the um, structures that allow us to repair, reuse, or recycle, then we're not going to. It's that simple. You know, you don't you don't have to you don't want to have to drive for forty miles to find somebody who can repair a shoe, right? <coughs> So you don't, and that's where we that's where we found ourselves. So this is a this is a social issue, and like I say, it's it's unfortunate that we of the boomer generation have kind of left you guys with this problem, um, all with the best intentions, of course, all thinking that this was the best possible world of worlds we could make. And then we suddenly realize, well, no, maybe not. Maybe we should have done this differently. <coughs> so the next 20, 30 years will be crucial, not just in the materials, but in the social structures that not just allow this, but demand it. And that's where you guys come in. Now, when we talk about reuse, repair, and recycling, there's a new phrase. There's the upcycling. It's the upcycling, which is, of course, just recycling with a different spin. But basically, what you're doing there is you're adding value. You're taking, a, you're taking an object, or you're taking a pre-used, pre-owned, or just a bunch of waste or something, and you're turning it into something with more value. And it occurs to me that this might be where we find the ideal solution to our industry's problem, or at least a way of introducing the solution. Maybe, I don't know, I don't know maybe, maybe this is no news to you. This was news to me. Maybe the solution is this is how we bring back couture. Maybe that's what couture has to become. There, for the past 50 years, the death of couture has been announced every couple of seasons, if not every season. Because it doesn't serve a purpose. It has no place in society. The um, social class that required couture, if you will, in the West, uh, largely disappeared. And Couture was sort of left behind with not much to work with except for the new rich and the uh, you know, latest bunch of uh, Wall Street bankers and such and such, which is, of course, probably fine. But it does seem to be floundering. It does seem to have lost its purpose. And there are few things as deadly to a social phenomenon as having no purpose. So here's where it might come back. Maybe the artisan tradition of couture returns as the artisan tradition of sustainability. In not creating day-to-day -day wear, at least not initially, but creating high fashion, high value, high impact items, which then, as couture is wont to do, holds the rest of the fashion world with it. Uh, you recognize these? Know what these are? Uh, these are from uh, the recent shows. This is uh, <coughs> Martin Margiela, called the Artisan Line, of course. And these are garments made of candy wrappers. 
So we actually have upcycled items in the full couture tradition on the catwalks already. And in my feeble brain, a little bell went off. Now, they were very proud of the fact that it took 70 hours to put one of these garments together. But of course, you who studied couture know that that's nothing. 70 hours is nothing. A couture garment can be hundreds of hours in the making. So you've got six weeks worth of handcraft up there on the, on the screen. All right? You've got your little petty mans there, sewing away, sewing away. And here's the solution. And this is also the solution to some of these sort of echo chic problems, in that with using materials like these, using garbage bags and candy wrappers and cereal boxes and whatnot, you've got a one-off, haven't you? You've got a garment that can only be worn once. Well, how many times does a couture garment get worn? Right? So maybe this is the way to go. This is how to subvert the entire system in one garment.